Welcome to our new series, Leading SA, where I sit down with some of the leaders of San Antonio to talk about some of the issues that we face here, some of the ways to fix the problems, and the vision of the future of the Alamo City. So far in this series, we've heard from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and a handful of city council members, but a city takes more than just local government to thrive. In today's episode, we actually sit down with SA 2020 CEO and President Molly Cox. We talk about what their mission is, what's happened here in the Alamo City over the last 10 years, and what's next. So we're to start off. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thanks Molly for having Cox, me. Molly yeah. leading SA right here. Well, yeah, I know. That's very fancy. <laughs> you have a graphic. Fake it till you make it. That's, <laughs> that's it. I like it. I like it. So we are talking with you, leading yes. SA. Mm-hmm. SA 2020. Yes. We're going to start off. Please explain what SA 2020 is to the people watching, if yeah. they haven't heard of it. Yeah, and also, why? Why haven't you heard of it? Mm -hmm. um, so it started uh, as a community visioning process 10 years ago under then-Mayor Julian Castro, who basically said, hey, we need to figure out a strategic plan for the next 10 years. And over the course of five public meetings, nearly 6,000 people came together. It's one of the arguably most successful community engagement processes that, have, that has occurred in San Antonio, where we said, all right, if you could maintain or preserve something in the next 10 years, what would it be? If you could improve or um, m just make things better in the next 10 years, what, the, what would that one thing be? And nearly 6,000 people said uh, multiple things that ultimately rose to what we call 11 community results, 11 areas, right? That range from arts and culture to transportation to education to economic competitiveness. And then we also said, great, if that's where you wanna go, these are the results that you wanna see over the next 10 years, how would you even know if we were getting closer to them? So even um, highlighting sort of key indicators for our community um, that we would monitor. Cities across the United States have done these sort of community visioning processes. And what typically occurs, right, is the report gets done and it's handed off to a mayor or a city department and we like go, great, remember that. And then it goes up on a shelf, like most strategic plans. And then 10 years later, we blow the dust off and go, hey, remember that thing we did? San Antonio was a little different in that um, I think uh, Mayor Castro at the time realized if I take it on as mine or if we take it on as a city thing, it's gonna die on the vine. And I, I think he was correct. San Antonio is the only large city in the United States of America that has that community vision written by people who live here. And then a separate nonprofit, that's us at SA 2020, whose job it is to just drive progress, hold us accountable to that community vision. And then more than 160 multi-sector organizations actively aligned to make that vision a reality. So that's where we are today, a separate nonprofit named SA 2020 who drives progress towards this shared community vision. Okay. Now we have the State of the Union coming up mm -hmm. this, this week. Yes. If you were to do a State of the Union, SA 2020, it is 2020. Mm -hmm. It is. What is your state of San Antonio looking at the findings? I think uh, the state of San Antonio is one that is showing incremental progress. 72% uh, of the indicators we currently track are moving in the right direction. Um, so doing better today than they were in 2010 when we started. So we know that there is progress occurring in San Antonio, Texas. And at the same time, there are challenges, complex community challenges that we're going to have to align around, right? We are one of the top cities for college-educated millennial growth and... Uh, one in three people can't afford the homes that they're living in, right? Um, or a third of our community doesn't have something beyond an associate's degree. Um, both of those things are happening simultaneously. And it shows us then, we, like college educated millennial growth didn't just happen, right? We worked to make ourselves a, a viable option for people who are younger and looking for work, right? Um, who see us as sort of an affordable, interesting, um, culturally relevant, awesome space to move to. And at the same time, the people who live here, we have struggles, right? So how are we sort of uh, saying I, yes and rather than either or? How are we helping both become this fantastic city for people to move to and a fantastic city for people who live here? Before we dive into the specifics. Sure. It's 2020. Yes. What is the plan for you guys going forward? I appreciate that question because we've never thought about it before um, until today. I kid, I jest, because um, when your name's got 2020 in right. it. Right. It seems like thinking, there's a finite period. You're, you're basically thinking about it every day uh, for the remainder. Um, SA 2020 was supposed to be a 10-year plan. We figure out where we go. Nobody knew what would come next. Um, and today, right, San Antonio has become this sort of like, 
um, space for other cities to even look at and say, how is this even working? And we believe it is because we set out a community vision. Here's where we want to go in the next 10 years. Um, and the momentum has never been stronger than it is today. And we don't have any intention of going anywhere. SA 2020 drives progress toward a shared community vision, and we believe that that's important. Um, so the year 2020, 10 years after we got started, we're using the entire year to do community engagement um, to basically reaffirm and strengthen San Antonio's community vision for the next decade. Okay. Any rebranding, possibly? Maybe SA 2030? Maybe. I don't know that we're going to be putting another timeline on there. Who says that SA 2020 couldn't just be a clear vision for the future? Boom. I'm just there. That, that. You could write I that just, on a shirt. Just laid that right. That's down. fantastic. <laughs> All right. So you actually, you had on the site, data is important, but it doesn't tell the full story. That's exactly right. Um, I think that the challenge for um, utilizing data uh, as the end all be all is that we lose sight of where we want to go. You never get in the car and then go, all right, let's, I think we can go straight and then we'll turn right and then maybe we'll go left up here. You say, where am I going first? And then you go that route, right? Data is what tells us whether or not we're moving in the right direction. And then it also allows us to determine where we need to pivot resources, right? Particularly if we begin to disaggregate data and see what population data is telling us once disaggregated um, by age, by race, by gender. Um, I think the challenge for us is when you look at data as being just up or down, what you're missing is the complete story around what that data represents. It's our students, it's our parents, it's our neighbors, um, right? It's people. Data represents people. And are the people that we are looking at ultimately getting closer to or further away from the vision that we've all generated? We are seeing, I mean, in accordance with the goals, mm -hmm. we're seeing a huge population growth, That's rapid right. increase of people coming to San Antonio, yeah. moving to San Antonio, but also getting educated here in San Antonio. That's right. We have the Alamo Promise program. That's right. How does that work in accordance with your data? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is speaking to sort of the complexity of trying to get to a result, right? So we know that if we were to increase college attainment in San Antonio MSA, um, by about 1%, we're talking bachelor's degrees, grow it by 1%, about 14,000 degrees, we could see a $1.4 billion economic return to our economy. Um, so of course, college attainment is something that we should be talking about, not just for the students, but for the community at large. It would, it would economically benefit us, the more people who have college degrees. Our goal uh, was to achieve 50% college attainment, attainment, associate's degrees or higher, uh, by the year 2020, and we flatlined in that. Um, the challenge then is to how, how are we having conversations more specifically around, and this is, gets to your point about data, right? Um, how are we having more holistic conversations, the affordability of college, the uh, barriers to college? Um, how are we getting students into college and then through college? So we don't just care about enrollment, right? We want to make sure that they get the degree or the certificate on the other end. So things like Alamo Promise or UTSA's Bold Promise or Texas A&M San Antonio's work with the Southside School Districts for Aspire give us um, very targeted approaches to making sure that students are not only college ready, but then enroll in college and get, then get through college so that they are then contributing not only to their own families and their own households, but to our community at large. It would be probably a biased response, but do you think SA 2020 has been instrumental in shaping what San Antonio looks like today and shaping the future, working with people in charge of these huge nonprofit organizations and with you know, getting people in, keeping them here, and helping our economy. Yeah, I mean, I would be the worst employee ever if I was like, no. <laughs> um, I will say that watching sort of other cities who have these community visions, what we have very clearly shown or seen is that when there is not this objective nonprofit or entity that sort of says, no, what we're doing is not moving the needle, or hey, this needs to really be a multi-sector, cross-sector collaborative uh, effort, that it's not moving, right? You can see it in other cities where this vision exists, but it doesn't really sort of act as an agenda or as the playbook for how policy should be created or nonprofits should be delivering programs or corporations or uh, funders should be giving out, like doing philanthropic giving. Um, I think what SA 2020 has been able to do is sort of build trust 
um, in our community uh, to because we are objective, because we don't shy away from when something's not so pretty, when it's when we're not showing sort of fantastic progress, when we're showing that we flatlined or when we're going backwards. Um, we've been very transparent in sort of holding um, our entire community accountable to the vision it says that it wants. Now, being the quote unquote gatekeeper of this agenda, yeah. How do you how do you keep you know the lawmakers and these large scale CEOs and you know these head people in charge? How do you keep them in check? Oh man, um, mm, tweets. I think it's always <laughs> about tweets. Uh, <laughs> isn't that how you keep people in check nowadays? Yeah, you can verbally tweets. assault them via social media. It's, it's totally fine. No, I think um, we've never put the community vision in front of anybody and had them say, "Nah, we disagree." Like you've never had anybody say, "Like, no, we don't want educational opportunity for everyone, no matter their zip code," right? What I think the community vision does is helps people see where they should be sort of aligning efforts, right? It's very difficult to um, sort of wake up in the morning and say, well, I'm gonna go off on my own little route when we know exactly what the community said it wanted, right? So when we talk about, uh, right, your $2.5 billion city budget or the nonprofit sectors, um, work in really targeted approaches and programs for for the communities that need it, or when we talk to funders about where they're putting their dollars in partnership with nonprofits and other efforts, um, we can always say, but this is where the community said it wanted to go. So does, does what you're doing at the micro level really impact the macro level? And if it doesn't, what are you doing it for? So to sort of keep or to hold people accountable, it's just basically going back out and just holding the mirror back up and saying, hey, did that thing you did actually move the needle on the thing we said we wanted? And if it didn't, it's time to pivot. Now, speaking of doing the things that you wanted, mm -hmm. there's two big things coming up in front of city council. Yeah. There's the Aquifer Protection Act. That's right. And then there is transportation. Oh, there's man. Via. Yeah, that's and right. And obviously transportation and renewable energy and water two huge parts of SA 2020. That's right. What are you guys, how are you guys working with city council, with the mayor, with everyone involved yeah. to go forward? Yeah, I think you're bringing up sort of where we um, have some very difficult conversations ahead of us, right? Um, if you look at the community indicators over the last nine years, transportation has been um, one of the cause areas that has had sort of the, the uh, not as great a movement. You know what, I'll Let's say it. Three of the worst numbers that we saw was the walkability, the That's commute right. time, and the miles and vehicles. That's right, and if you think about it, right, we were talking about the growth of our community. Are we ever going to be able to sort of backtrack on our commute times or our vehicle miles traveled, right? Um, are we building neighborhoods that allow for walkability? And for us, we consistently say our community said it wanted more walkable neighborhoods. Our community said it wanted fewer miles traveled. Our community said they wanted to reduce commute times. And I think the challenge on that is there isn't a buckshot, right? There isn't like, you don't wave the magic wand and like one thing happens and we fixed it. It's a complex communications conversation and it's a complex solution. To fix our transportation in San Antonio, and we're talking multimodal transportation, right? To be able to walk or bike or scooter, Scoot, I was gonna, scoot? I was gonna say scooter, but yeah, <laughs> scoot, scoot, scoot works. where you want um, to use public transportation or your own cars, I think is a conversation around how are we thinking about transit? It's not about just getting in a car and driving or getting on the bus and moving. It's how transportation, our streets, our lifelines to the things that matter the most to us, our jobs, our families, our healthcare, our schools, right? So if we are to ultimately consider transit, multimodal transit in a real way, then it's understanding the complexities of everything that sort of touches transit or that transit touches. Um, and I think right now we are desperate to shift a narrative from either or, which is what's happening around this aquifer protection and transportation. It's either aquifer protection or it's transportation. And we're like, how? That's not even real, right? It's a yes and conversation. How are we protecting our aquifer and making public transit and multimodal transit easier for everyone in our community? And it's possible we've done harder things together right so how are, why aren't we having that conversation now jumping off of there uh, the mayor called the last 10 years the decade of downtown mm -hmm. he says this next 
we'll say decade, is going to be the era of mobility. Mm -hmm. Not only transportation-wise with lofty goals That's in right. regards to VIA, the SA to DC trip going on, right. but also socioeconomically. Yeah. And that was uh, a lot of the numbers that we saw positive, the unemployment rate. Uh, employment in target industries. How do you guys work with other companies or do you work with other companies to come into San Antonio? Yeah, we don't. Um, so our role is very much at a macro level. What we work with is our partners. So San Antonio Economic Development Foundation is one of our partners, right? And they are very specifically have targeted approaches to making sure that we have the right companies coming to San Antonio, that the jobs are here and available. Um, I'm always interested, right, in this idea of and to this idea of the era of mobility it's it speaks directly to what I was saying right which is transportation is a lifeline to right everything else um, but I think secondarily to that is this idea around yes our unemployment rates are down and yes our um, employment and in target industries is up and we utilize target industries because that's where the growth is that's where the jobs are right and at the same time so this goes to that like either or versus yes and and we're saying everything is yes and our underemployment rates continue to increase um, we are seeing professional certifications have not grown the route that we need them to. So this becomes a conversation around um, recruitment and retention, right? Helping our homegrown talent as much as we are helping new talent in our community get jobs that they need. And I think both of those things can be happening simultaneously. And I think based on sort of like Alamo Promise and UTSA's pro bold promise and Aspire that we're starting to see how we need to do even a broader and bigger investment in our homegrown talent. One thing that we're going to be looking to apparently uh, Trinity's doing an extensive research into the brain drain. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be interesting. It will be interesting. Yeah. We're also the boomerang effect is also interesting. People who leave and then come back to San Antonio. So, yeah. Okay, so going to back to what you talked about in the beginning, community yeah. engagement. You guys are taking this year to right. reach out Please explain. Yeah, so we, um, in the in a decade ago, five public community meetings was a big deal that nearly 6,000 people participated. It's been a decade, community engagement. We've been watching sort of public engagement and community engagement across the United States as well as locally to sort of figure out what does it look like to really engage people in solutions, um, to really ask them what they want to see, um, and to really up the amount of representation in our community. We have a pretty uh, big goal of the people we want to participate, 162,850 people. Um, is what we want at the end of this um, year-long engagement Why that process. <laughs> it's, all, it's, not, it's not just a random number. Be um, impressive if it was. Uh, yeah, no, I just pulled it out right now. No, uh, we have nearly 70 what we're calling ambassadors who represent large and small institutions who are college uh, and career advisors at local high schools to um, the chairman of VIA, Ray Saldana, right? Um, so sort of a wide range of people who are working to help us engage, um, people who wouldn't necessarily participate uh, in a public engagement process. Um, and then rather than asking them to come to us for community engagement, we are going to them. Um, based on those nearly 70 ambassadors and our partners with over 160 multi-sector institutions, we think we can reach 162,850 people. We have a continuum of community engagement. It moves from like informed, did you even know a community vision existed? Do you know that a, a nonprofit actually holds us accountable to that vision, that 160 institutions are really aligning towards that? And it moves to um, consulting. Where do, where do you want to see us go in the next 10 years? Um, that survey is open right now um, at SA2020.org. It it's three questions. It takes five minutes um, to answer those questions. It then moves into engagement and co-create and into activate, right? So how do you move people along a continuum of of public engagement from just sort of learning about stuff to really getting involved, feeling like their voices are being heard. Um, it, there's something very uh, powerful, right, about a community vision that was written by humans who live here, then being the agenda by which policymakers create policy or public institutions invest dollars or nonprofits shift the way that they're doing um, their programming. It feels very much like uh, we built this from the ground up. The progress that has been seen over the course of the last decade is, again, not by happenstance, one, but two, was made because we as a community said this is where we want to go. So I, f I feel like there's a, a space around um, something to celebrate in that. It's almost like true democracy. Like almost. <laughs> <laughs> like almost there, yeah. So when we do hit the ballot time, mm -hmm. 
say voters want to go against some of these large-scale plans, say they vote against pre-K for SA, mm -hmm. how do you guys pivot? Um, I don't know that we necessarily pivot. I think that's an interesting conversation. I, I will tell you, we have um, over 1,500 surveys completed as of today. Um, so we did a public launch two weeks ago. As of today, over 1,500 surveys are completed. Um, and what we're seeing rise to the top as the things that are like, hey, we want to see this improved, um, public transit, shockingly and not shockingly at all, education, shockingly and not shockingly at all, right? When people say education, what do they mean? It's all over the place. So it ranges from, hey, better at literacy, our community as a whole, we want to see more in college attainment, we want to see better kinder readiness. Um, so we're seeing those all come in from an education space. These are all things that we're currently tracking as a community as well. I think what's really interesting about um, the idea around sort of pre-K for SA being on the ballot or transit being on the ballot, our job at SA 2020 is just to remind people that a community vision exists, right? That there are ways in which we can get there. We may disagree on the, um, on the route, right, how to get there, but we all generally agree that we want better multimodal transit in San Antonio. No one's saying like, nah, I, I would much rather sit in traffic for two and a half hours. We all agree that educational opportunities should be uh, for everyone, right? No matter their zip code. Maybe we disagree on the, on the methods, but we don't disagree on the ultimate result, the final end. And I think that's the conversation to be having. When Pre-K for SA came up uh, originally, um, it was very much sort of aligned to the community vision. You said, as a community, you wanted children to be better prepared for kindergarten. Here's an opportunity to make that occur. Um, and I think that's the same thing now, right? It's you, if we're consistently seeing that we want um, students to be better prepared for kindergarten, since we haven't yet flipped the script, as Sarah Bure at Pre-K for SA says, which is make schools ready for kindergartners, um, then we should be talking about Pre-K for SA, which has shown there's a, a study out of the, oh man, I'm gonna miss up, mess up Mike Villarreal's Institute of Education at UTSA, they did a study on pre-K for SA and those students overwhelmingly have higher, um, they're now in third grade, right? Our first cohort has gone through. Their math scores are higher than uh, by like far reaching Texas students and their reading scores are higher. So we're seeing that pre-K is actually Pre-K for SA is actually also delivering on what they said they would do, right? Um, and they're reaching through funding and teacher development and students. By the end of 2021, they'll have reached over 440,000 students. Um, and I think that there's a conversation to be had around, like, are we being transparent when we're reporting back out on, is Pre-K for SA a thing that we should be um, working towards? Yeah, right? They're showing us the results. I, I mean, if you don't like the results, that's a different conversation. But if we're talking about data doesn't tell the full story, the full story is, are we preparing our students for school and kinder readiness? And then are they staying at a good enough grade level, right? Are they staying at a space where they're ready enough for third grade, for eighth grade, for high school graduation rates? And, you know, the case can be made that we begin preparing our workforce at when they come out, right? They're gonna end up in our economic development. So why aren't we fully preparing all of our students in the way that they need to be? Direct correlation between young education and employment. Absolutely, that's not me. I don't work for Pre-K for SA, right? I make no money off of this. I'm saying it, the results are there. It's showing us in the data. Okay, now going off some of the negatives. Okay. Sorry, I have to point them no, out. No, you should. Professional certificates. Yeah. That's a big one. Um, you You're know, we hear right. from companies, you know, they're even having hard times filling a lot of buildings downtown. That's right. A lot of companies don't want to come in because they don't think that there's the talent here. That's right. How does that directly correlate with professional certificates? Oh, I, yeah, the, you're 100% right that companies are looking at our educational attainment rates or our professional certification completion and saying, we don't have the talent here. And we would say the talent is here. We're not preparing them, right? Um, how, what are we doing in an effort to flip the script again and say, our, the talent is here. We have 1.5 million people here. We've got the talent. Um, are we giving them um, the tools that they need to get the jobs that are available today? You know, back in 
2015, we released this uh, report, Talent Pipeline Task Force report, that showed we were producing one person for every 10 IT jobs that are available. So of course we have to bring people, we're recruiting people in, because there's 10 IT jobs available and we're only producing one person. So to this professional certificate space, right, we know that that's tied to so many things, barriers to uh, cost, uh, understanding sort of what jobs are available and what those certificates are looking for. San Antonio Works, or SA Works, which is out of uh, the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation, puts out sort of a quarterly jobs report that just shows what's being, a, what's being offered to the community at large. What are the jobs that are currently um, looking for people to fill? And across the board, you're seeing it's people who need professional certificates, associate's degrees, training, or a bachelor's, right? Something beyond high school. We know that that's there. So what are we doing for our community that's helping prepare them? And I think by monitoring professional certificates and seeing how that's going down, um, that's a challenge. And it also, right, then can tie back to, let's, nothing is by itself in a silo, right? We could tie that back to recidivism rates. Uh, in San Antonio, Texas, we said we wanted to see recidivism rates go down, right? Somebody gets arrested, we want them to get out of the system and then never return to the system again. And our recidivism rates are, we're dropping. They're, they're worse, right, today. Um, the, there's a direct correlation. You see it. Somebody who's been arrested um, has a harder time getting housing, going back to school, getting a job. And I'm like, here's an entire population that if we were being serious about getting more professional certificates and getting people into positions and jobs, here's an entire population of people that if we were to provide supports would be able to get out of, right? They've entered into a system. We would get them out of the system and then actually help get them into jobs, help get them professional certificates certificates, help get them into housing, and we would immediately start ticking the boxes, right, of homelessness, economic development, education, right, like across the board. So it's for us looking at sort of how everything is interrelated and then finding, right, who you, what your organization or institution is responsible for and how you can pivot your resources or understand community need in an effort to better serve them. All of that being intertwined mm -hmm. and so many of the 11 big categories being intertwined. That's right. What were some of the, the big picture items that jump out to you? You've 10 years of data, 10 years of research at this yeah. point. I know it's not just about the data. No, yeah. But what are some of those big picture elements that jump out to you? Yeah, so you immediately when we started tracking this, we saw high school graduation rates go up. Um, it was one of the, that and um, police response times going down. One of the first, like those are our first two that we sort of hit almost immediately, which is institutional, right? Like high school can get more students graduated if they're really focusing on graduation rates. Uh, police and fire response times can go down if they're fixing the processes by which it was making it longer. I'll say that to you, that those are sort of institutionally, quickly they fixed it. Now, if we're talking multi-sector, cross-sector. I, I would argue that's cross-sector because that's transportation. Absolutely. Totally, if you're like, hey, we're bringing every, all of these things down. If we're getting more students out of high school, that means we're getting them into the workforce. Now we need to get them into certificate programs, et cetera, right? It's all multi-sector. But I'm saying like institutionally, they changed some processes and then we're able to sort of fix something quickly. If we look across sectors, I would say the San Antonio Teen Pregnancy Prevention Collaborative is one I will tout forever. Um, we're talking city, county, healthcare institutions, nonprofits, um, who came together knowing that San Antonio said we want to reduce our teen pregnancy rate by 15% by the year 2020. So in 2011, 2012, they came together, they said, let's figure it out. Over the course of six years, they've not only reduced our teen pregnancy rate by 15%, they've reduced our teen pregnancy rate by 46%. One of the largest decreases in the nation. We still have a ridiculously high rate of teen pregnancy. Um, we're still at the top in that space, but the reduction was so significant, right? And it's because multi-sector saying, all right, I think we can be responsible for doing this better. Okay, I think we can be responsible for doing this better. A 46% reduction in teen pregnancy, then, right, talk ripple effects, high school graduation rates, college attainment, uh, maternal and infant health. We know that young moms are more uh, prone to giving birth early, preterm birth. Um, and we know that everything that comes with that is, right? Um, potential disability, potential death. There's challenges in learning as we go. So we just begin a cycle. So the fact that we've reduced our teen pregnancy rate by 46% had such a, 
oh, like a like this giant ripple effect of just great progress across the board was to me something very significant. Um, and it shows, again, if you bring people together around a common goal, positive community change can happen. People watching this might say, why can't you just use that model for other big issues, crime? Why can't you just use that for crime? We agree. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> also, I think the challenge always is um, uh, teen pregnancy was sort of very specific, right? Even when you're talking about uh, secular versus religious conversations, we're saying take out sort of how you're ultimately moving the needle and just tell us what you want to take, the piece that you want to take of teen pregnancy um, and how are you reducing it? And then let's evaluate it. Did it work? Did it not work? It, does this one work better than this one, right? Let's, let's use the data and figure out who's doing better where. When you look at things like um, we want to reduce commute times, um, for example. It's a good one. But, yeah, I mean, everybody, nobody wants to just sit in their car. We're talking across the board, the amount of people that have to sit at the table are, well, where is our development happening, right? Because we could reduce commute times if people live closer to their jobs, right? Um, which we know is not occurring. Let's, we can talk about that too, right? People who are working in downtown don't live downtown. They live in surrounding areas and even up north, right? Well, so people are commuting. Everyone wants to pay $1,500 for a studio. Then see, there it is, right? Affordability is also part of that, which would reduce commute times as well, because if I could afford the place near my job, then I would do that. There's a space around sort of understanding infrastructure, right? Um, we'll just add more lanes, um, which would just add more cars, which would just add more people you could stare at while you're sitting on the freeway. Um, it's public transit. Are we funding that at the rate that we need to in order to increase frequency? So commute times isn't just like, oh, well, here, I'll just go faster, right? There's multiple sort of spaces around that. So I think the challenge is understanding your role in a very complex issue and saying, well, and my role in this issue is X. And I think for something like commute times, we sometimes forget that even as individuals, we can play into, right? We can play inside these institutional challenges because we work within the institutions we seek to change. So as a voter, I have an opportunity to help decrease commute times, right, by voting, um, by finding the people who are going to help us do better in multimodal transit or by voting on transit or whichever, right? Um, that as a commuter, I have an opportunity to participate. Do I, can I take different transportation options? Can I take the bus one day or can I use a bicycle or a scooter or walk rather than take my car to a short a short distance? Um, and are my streets available for that, right? Do I feel safe? Um, I think as a person who runs a business, I have an opportunity to play in commute times by saying, hey, you know, it's a, you don't need to drive into work every single day. You can stay at home and work from home. Um, or, hey, here's a bus pass. We want to make sure that people are utilizing that. So I think in every instance, what we hope people are doing is waking up in the morning and thinking about, which sounds so kumbaya, we will sing in just a minute, um, but what am I doing today that has an ultimate impact on the vision our community wants, uh, that it sees for itself, the results that we want to see, how is what I'm doing today ultimately impacting that? Okay, last question. Okay. Oh, no. No, no, it's not a bad question. Okay. You look at the results. Yeah. How do you feel when you look 10 years ago and to today, what is your big takeaway? You know, what people watching this, yeah. when they say, all right, you guys have had 10 years of data, 10 years of working with our city leaders, leading SA, mm -hmm. what is your takeaway? Should people be optimistic for the future? We have a million more people. Are these problems going to get worse or are you guys staying with a plan? Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, there's so many, there's so much in that. How much time do we have? We have an hour and a half? Okay, good. I would uh, say we have about 5.30 <laughs> left. Um, I'm going to say that I think um, the biggest takeaway is that when you work together towards common goals, positive community change happens. We have literally proved that with 10 years worth of information, right? Um, but more specifically, I think what we're starting to see even more is that people are having honest conversations, um, that we are... Um, it, it, in the middle of one of the most contentious election years, I think, um, that I've at least witnessed in my lifetime, you have a city of more than a million people 
who have said, hey, let's spend the next year. Yeah, yeah, we know that there's, we will vote if we, right, we've got that. We know that the census is this year. And also, how about we come together and reaffirm and strengthen a community vision? Like that's, to me, sort of what we've seen over the last 10 years that has proven uh, to be the most exceptional. The idea that an entire community of our size can say, this is where we wanna go and can we go there together? Can all of us get there? Um, that to me is probably the biggest revelation. Okay, perfect. Molly Cox. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Throughout Leading Essay, we'll hear from plenty of other local leaders, but we also want to hear from you. Head to ksat.com right now, search Leading Essay, tell us what problems you're passionate about in your community, and we can ask your questions.